this is blowing my mind. I didn't know it was this complicated. This no. is so complicated. Oh my goodness, yeah. It must be wow. exhausting to be a Brit. Is it exhausting? Hey guys, I'm Eric. And I'm Grace. We're the Wandering Ravens. We are a couple of digital nomads who have been wandering around the world for over three years, and we make videos about travel and culture. If either of those topics interest you, make sure you subscribe to our channel and hit the little bell icon so that you can get notified every time we release a new video. Today we are going to be reacting to British classism, and this video deserves a little backstory. The other day we were chatting with some friends, and they made reference to the classes in the UK, and this comment caught us by surprise because up until that moment, we hadn't really heard anything about there being social classes in the UK. As Americans, we are aware that there were class differences back in the day, you know? We read Jane Austen books and a lot of other novels <laughs> from a couple hundred years ago, and the class divide is very apparent in books like that. So we were aware of those differences, but we didn't know that that was something that was still present in the mm -hmm. UK. So as of today, we still know very little about classism in the UK. We know that there's an upper class, a middle class, and I'm not sure what they call the bottom one. After the call with our friends, we realized that this is kind of a unique opportunity. There's this big issue in the UK, classism, and it's something that we know nothing about. So before spoiling it by going and researching it ourselves, we decided to make this video of us watching some videos about classism in the UK to kind of catch our genuine reactions and see uh, what we think. Yeah. Yeah. This is kind of our introduction to this UK issue, so we're very curious, we know very little, and we're ready to learn. Yeah. <laughs> so please don't hate on us. We are admitting that we are ignorant about this topic. This just isn't something that made it across the Atlantic when we were in school. But as always, we see this as a learning opportunity for ourselves and you guys, so that you can see what a couple of ignorant Americans look like, <laughs> and that we have the opportunity to ask our questions to you, and you guys can answer them down in the comments. <laughs> is this an uncomfortable thing to talk about? I feel like it probably is. This might be an uncomfortable thing to talk yeah. about. I apologize. Again, I don't know. Is it? We're, we're about to find out, I guess. Yeah, this may or may not be an uncomfortable topic. But before we begin, if you enjoy our videos and want to help us make better videos more often, consider joining our Patreon. Link in the description below. Now for format. We have a couple of videos lined up that friends have sent us about classism in the UK. We're gonna go through and watch a few of them, kind of just get a grip of what's going on over there, and react. And now let's get into it. This is Americans reacting to British classism. Our first video is called John Cleese and the Two Ronies Class System. Whoops! We seem to have had a little problem while we were editing this video. Whoever owns the rights to the class sketch by John Cleese and the Two Ronies went around YouTube and deleted every single video that contains it, including all the reaction videos to it. So we've decided not to include it here because if we did, we would risk getting our video deleted as well and we don't want that to happen. If you're familiar with the sketch, we are gonna include the thoughts that we had after watching the sketch in this video. So keep watching for those. But if you're not familiar with the sketch and you just wanna get into us reacting to a video that you can watch along with, skip ahead a couple minutes to this timestamp and that's where we start reacting to the next video. A thought I have after that sketch would be how much does class come into your identity in, in the sense of, for example, they're all saying, I am upper class, I am middle class, and I know my place. D on your day to day, does a person have in their identity, for example, I am English, I am middle class. You know, I am English, I am lower class, you know, if that's what it's mm -hmm. called. That seems a bit foreign. If that's the way it is, that does seem a bit foreign in how in the States, we don't really think about class in that way. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, we use the word middle class a lot, so a lot of people aspire to be middle class mm -hmm. and want to be middle class, but I don't think people carry it as an identity. Yeah, it's not something that you're always thinking about. Other things are much more a part of your identity, like your style or your mm -hmm. ethnicity, your race. Yeah. Yeah. All, your religion, just different things like that are much more so like this makes up who I am. Yeah. So that that is that is a good question. Like would that be something that really identifies a British person? 
Yeah. Or just you as a British person, do you are you conscious of which class you're in? And do you feel a sense of attachment to that class? I guess that would be another question too, is class mobility. How easy is it to move through the classes? Like if you're in the lower class and then you start a good business and you make a lot of money, can you just move up? Or is it a more difficult process? Yeah, is yeah. it like some class systems where it's almost impossible to change from one to the other? If you're born yeah. into it, you're just kind of there. Yeah. The next documentary that we're going to be watching is called The Grumpy Guide to Class, and it's by the BBC. So Ooh. hopefully this will teach us a lot more about class and maybe even answer some of these questions that we've been pontificating about. Here at Grumpy Mission Control, our job is to identify subjects that the cheerfully challenged find irritating, like the class system. Instilled into us since we were nippers, whether you're old-fashioned working class, a hooray. Ah, there, he just said working class. Oh, working class. So okay, that, so it's not lower class. Maybe that's a number three. So we have upper class, middle class, working, working class. class. And he also said another word. What was that? Whether you're old fashioned working class, a hooray, a toff. Hooray? Hooray and toff. What is a hooray? And what is a toff? Toff sounds negative to me. I really like very, very posh people. I think they're hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> My mum used to get posh when, you know, answering the phone. My name is Bouquet. That's B U C K E T. Is posh the same as being upper class? No. Oh. Observation there, because they've been using the word posh a whole lot. Yeah. And so when I hear posh, I think they're referring to people of the upper class. But she just said that posh and upper class were not the same thing, right? That's yeah. That's what she just said. I've always associated those two things. Mm -hmm. If you're posh, then you live in a manor house. Or something like this. You talk like the queen. We have to start our romp through the class system somewhere. So we're better than the head toffs, the royal family. The ones with all the money. Our money, oddly. Head toffs. Ah, head -toffs. so toffs, you were right, then it is the Must be the upper, upper echelons of society. Mm -hmm. There were the photographs of Buckingham Palace that came out of, of how the Queen actually lived. And it was just like a caricature. It was like she'd had Dick Emery in to do her interior decoration. The Queen is supposed to have a magnificent collection of glass animals. Imagine all that money. And that's what you think to do with it. We have a magnificent collection of wooden elephants. Horton. Horton. And friends. Horton and friends. <laughs> oh, I love it. Horton and friends. Look at Princess Anne's wardrobe. The woman has been wearing the same clothes from... Okay, I don't know who Princess Anne is. Charles is the Queen's son. Yes, Maybe Charles. Maybe it's one of Charles' children? No, Charles was... Did he have a girl? I thought he just had the two boys. With the Queen? And a daughter. We don't know. We don't know who Princess Anne is. <laughs> All that to say, we're probably but butchering. We're very sorry that we don't know who Princess Anne is, but we are not up to date. On, on the our, royals. On the royals. <laughs> we know very little about the royals. Next rung down from the royals on our feudal class system are the properly posh, the toffs, the landed gentry, what's left of them. Landed gentry, there's a term we know. It's a Jane Austen term. So who are the landed gentry now? Well, I guess we'll find out. I mean, the thing with the toffers, they talk like that, don't they? They're sort of, and they say words like, they get very excited about words like extraordinary and frightfully and mummy and daddy. The thing about the very, very upper class people is actually they don't move their mouths when they're speaking. And they presume that everybody else is utterly deaf. They're very loud because they want everybody to look at them and look at them with envious eyes saying, my God, they're posh, they must be so rich. I used to think, well, what is a chinless wonder? What is a, a hooray Henry? These, these chinless people. And then you see them and they are chinless. Chinless wonder and hooray Henry. We don't know those terms. We <laughs> don't. Chinless wonder. I quite like upper class people. I quite like hooray. They don't mug you. You know, they don't chase you down the street. You don't think, oh, there's six chinless wonders walking down the alley. I better hide my phone. What does it mean to be chinless? Because he keeps on saying they are actually chinless. What, what does that mean? What happened to their chin? Maybe they're fat? No, that can't that be wouldn't right. Be it. Then you have more chins. Maybe they just... They have garden ponds the size of Lake Windermere and front drives as long as the M6. But for all that, perhaps because of that, do they actually have any money? I think quite possibly if you're old money, you would be quite hard up because a lot of your money is in land. Unless you sell it, which you, you sort of can't do, 
um, then you're, you're stuck in the, uh, you know, the family house, which hasn't been rewired for 50 years. Did she just say you can't sell it? So why can't they sell their land, I wonder? Yeah, that seems a bit... Or maybe it's like, it's their only asset is land. Oh. And then if they sell it, they'll get money, but then they won't have anything else. Hmm. Wild speculations! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we do have the term old money in the States, mm -hmm. but we don't have very much old money. Uh, I remember we read a book about millionaires one time. By Chris Hogan? Yes, that yes. was the one. Yeah, a financial book. And it was uh, explained how in the United States, only about 20% of millionaires inherited their wealth. The vast majority, over 80% of millionaires, actually created it themselves. Mm -hmm. So, lots of new money. Tough training school. So is this something that upper class parents still do nowadays? Boarding school? Yeah, just all of them will do this. Boarding schools are a little bit few and far between in the States. Yeah, I don't know, any, I don't know anyone who's been to boarding school. Are boarding schools still a thing in the UK? Let us know. And is that really common for parents to just ship their kids off to boarding school if they're upper class? Reasonable parents wouldn't send their children away to school. Mind you, I've sent two of mine away, so there you go. The whole concept of kids now is it costs £100,000 to send a kid to school and university. That's what you've wow. got to factor in. One hundred. I'm thinking, hope mine's a bit of a duffer, my lad. I haven't got £100,000. <laughs> duffer. Duffer. I don't know that one. I don't. I know Dauber now. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Sandwiched miserably in between top and bottom is the middle class. Miserably? Nowhere is the class struggle more prevalent than here. That would be different from the States because in the States I, I feel that everyone wants to be middle class. They want to be comfortable but they don't want to be wealthy. Like mm -hmm. a lot of people don't want to be in the upper class in the States because mm -hmm. they're very negatively perceived. And so a lot of people would love to be just anywhere within the middle class range. That would be the, the American dream yeah, the Ameri is a middle class dream. Yeah, it's yeah. true. But he just said sandwich miserably. <laughs> so maybe in the UK being middle class is not preferable. Great, great way to pick up on that. I didn't even notice. <laughs> it seems like things would be the comfiest for middle class people because they don't have to worry about Mm -hmm. being upper class all the time. And you have enough money to be comfortable? Yeah. Let us know. Are middle class people miserable? And if so, why? The middle classes live with their upwardly mobile pretensions, punishing mortgage repayments and aspirational tastes. Universally ridiculed and universally insecure, they take the most stick from everyone. Universally ridiculed, universally insecure. If that's a description of the UK middle class, that is very different than the way the middle class is perceived in the States. Yeah, I would say entirely the opposite, because mm. I think if you're middle class, you're not insecure and you're not ridiculed. You would be ridiculed for being upper class, but in the middle class, you'd be cushy yeah. and fine. We want you to be middle class. They haven't got the luxury of the trust fund to fall back on, and they haven't got the luxury of not caring. There is a theory that the middle class have less fun than it, because they're always striving onwards and upwards. So desperate are the middle classes to climb the social ladder that their kids are pushed into a punishing timetable of self-improving pursuits, in the hope that they might sneak into top land when no one's looking. No wonder the middle classes have such a horrid time. That's a difference, too. The narrator said that middle class people are trying to get into top land, he called it. And the way that they do that is by training their kids into a lot of things like mm -hmm. sports and dancing and music. So in the UK, are habits or activities things that determine mm -hmm. class? Because in the States, if you wanted to get into the upper class, you know, you don't really care about what your kids do. It's just about yeah. making money. Though again, we don't really use the term upper class in the States. You know, maybe if you're a sociologist, you'll use the word, but mm -hmm. in just the lingua franca, the everyday speech of the people, we don't talk about upper class people. There's rich people, we talk about the rich. Yeah, we do, we talk about the rich. Yeah, but not mm -hmm. necessarily as a class. That that was kind of confusing as well. The, the way he phrased it was just how you would jump that divide. And use kids as a way to do it. Yeah, through these actions, how you'd suddenly end up there. Yeah. 
It's a different route than the one we take in the States. Whether or not you're middle class or rich is just determined by your bank account. What does your bank account say? Not, you know, what classes your kids are taking. I'm really curious about the way you move between classes in the UK and why children would be seen as stepping stones from one to the other. I don't think the middle class are the most unhappy class, I just think they're the best at moaning. Moaning middle classes as if. No, smart plan is to admit to being middle class but play up your working class roots. Boast that you had to break the ice in your outside loo, get some credibility that way. Pretend you were brought up in a paper bag, preferably in the north. You get a room full of people, you say, what class are you? Most people would say, most ordinary people would say, working class. It's a badge of honour, isn't it? See, inverted snobbery, it's the kind of, oh no. Yeah, yeah, I've made a few quid, I've got a nice house, kids go to private school, but you know what, my dad used to work shifts. Uh, that's interesting, because the way that they're talking about the working class would be the way that in the States we might talk about the middle class. Mm-hmm. Because everyone wants to admit to being middle class. Yeah, nobody wants to admit to being low income or mm -hmm. having to, you know, yeah. any, anything like that. People don't want to, people are not proud of being low income in the States. Yeah. And so, yeah, the way they're talking about the working class is, as you said, the way in the States we talk about middle class. Because everyone would like to be proudly middle class mm -hmm. and wouldn't hesitate to admit that. Whereas if you were a low income person in the States, you would not really admit that to anyone. Yeah. We used to live in this tiny old tumble down house with great big holes in the roof. <laughs> house. You were lucky to live in a house. We used to live in one room, all 26 of us, no furniture, half the floor was missing. We were all huddled together in one corner for fear of falling. You were lucky to have a room. We used to have to live in the corridor. Oh, we used to dream of living in a corridor. I wonder why they feel the need to deflect middle classness. We've heard a lot yeah. about British self-deprecation. So in British humor, for example, a lot of jokes are self-deprecating. You're always putting yourself down. Is that what it is? Like it's just, you know, in British culture, it's there's this thing about not taking yourself too seriously. Is that what it is? Or is it another I feel thing? like it might be another thing, but that's just because neither of the other two classes in the brief amount that they've talked about them have had the same attitude towards Ah. deflecting their their class that they're in. Yeah, like it didn't say that the upper class mm -hmm. have a similar need to deflect. Yeah, and then also what the few comments that they made on working class and how people will all mm -hmm. want proudly, to be. yeah, take on the title of working class ah. also kind of indicates that this is a uniquely middle class thing. If you have any insight to offer on why middle class people feel the need to, to deflect that they're middle class and claim to be working class, let us know. Because that is a really interesting thing to us. I'd love to know why that is and kind of the psychology behind that. I do come from a very working class background and it's not, you know, th there's no scandal in our family. There was never a time when somebody had to sell the family silver. So it's not like I had to worry that, that, that nothing's been passed down. There was nothing to pass down. I don't want this to come across the wrong way, but it does seem like if you're middle class and you're deflecting to be working class and you're playing up those roots, oh, you know, I, I had a, came from a troublesome background and had to go endure all this hardship and now I'm here, really emphasizing your working classness. It seems kind of like a humble brag. Like if I'm solidly middle class, I have a middle class house and clothes and drive a nice car. But then I continue to insist that, oh, you know, when I was a kid, I was dirt poor and lived in a paper bag. Then in a roundabout way, I am bragging that yeah. I accomplished a lot and got yeah. out You're of drawing that. attention to the fact that even mm -hmm. though you act as though you're trying to not do that, you're tr you are in fact drawing attention to the fact that you are different in a different place than you were. Yes. So it is kind of like the way that a lot of, uh, you know, first generation successful Americans might brag about their wealth or be really flashy on Instagram or buy fancy watches. And mm -hmm. they're like, see what I did? See what I did? Yeah. They're, they're bragging in a very upfront way. But these middle class Brits are bragging also, but in a more roundabout, yeah. very British way. Like we've talked about that a lot in other videos, how British people are very indirect. And mm -hmm. so again, this is all just pontificating, but maybe it's not that the middle class people are insecure. Mm -hmm. but that just being British, you're not allowed to brag and yeah. so, or take yourself too seriously. And so you do it in an indirect way. Mm, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Mm. I wouldn't have thought of that, but mm. I think it's very interesting. It's a thought. You can let us know. <laughs> let us know. <laughs> right, how much is it? 180 quid. Brilliant. 180 lottery tickets, please, Revy. The single biggest difference I would imagine between the working class and the middle class when it comes to money is the working class would spend the last quid on a scratch card because that might make the middle class 
And the middle class, the last thing they would do is buy a scratch card because that would make them working class. So there are certain activities that you will or will not do depending on your class. Yeah, that's very interesting. I would like to know what other ones there are. How far does this extend? Does this also extend to what sorts of drinks or food you would order when going out to eat? Is this a whole litany of things? And this is just one example. Now that being working class is so fashionable, and the poorer the better, it's quite hard to define what working class actually is. In the old days, it was easy. They went to work in a factory in identical flat caps. They came home to their tea and lived in black and white cobbled streets. How quaint. But now, plasterers earn more than solicitors, and plumbers earn more in a day than middle managers earn in a week. Trade, as it used to be called, is suddenly the new posh. It used to be really easily understandable what class you were in by your job. If you were a bricklayer, you were working class. If you were a doctor, you were middle class. If you worked in finance or you were an explorer or a basket weaver, <laughs> then you were upper class. But now it's been completely turned upside down. It used to be that if somebody said they were, say, a carpenter or a gardener, that almost by definition meant they were working class. But I mean now, uh, maybe I'm talking specifically about North London, but I mean half the guard, the so-called gardeners I meet are actually sort of the on Toby something or other. I mean, they're always a sort of thicker, younger son of some aristocratic. So the children of the middle class go to university and do media studies, and then if they're lucky, they oh. get a job as a runner That's interesting. for a, a, a TV company earning 120 quid a week if they're lucky, and having to make the tea. Whereas the ones who go to plumbing school and learn how to do something useful are earning 50 grand a year. I think the occupation side of things are interesting because they said how it used to be very evident which class you were in based off of your occupation. Mm -hmm. But nowadays it's harder to tell based off of occupation. And yeah. that's something I hadn't really thought. Another thing too was there he mentioned that if you're working class, you could be making 50K a year, whereas someone who's middle class and went to public school might be making, you know, 20,000 a year. But the person who's making 50,000 a year would still be considered working class. Even though in the States, if he was making that much every year, he would be solidly middle class. Yeah. That again shows that maybe this isn't tied to money. As much. As much as it is in the States. Because mm. in the States, I think it's all about money. And then you have to look at what's inside someone's house to do an accurate class reading. And what you put in your house and how you arrange it all is critical class-wise. First big class dilemma, what to do with your windows. Nothing to do with keeping daylight out and everything to do with social status, apparently. Do you have shutters or do you have net curtains? Those are the, the, you know, the defining minutiae now of the new class-less society. If you have lots of heavily patterned carpets, common as muck, unless they're rugs, in which case it's fine. The further up the income scale you go, solid coloured carpets or seagrass matting. Well, there used to be a floor covering rule amongst certain kinds of upper middle class people that wood must show. What they meant was fitted carpets are terrible, fitted carpet, carpets are enough. It sounds very complicated. This is very complicated. Yes. Oh my goodness, so everything from what you put into your house, it doesn't even matter about practicality from the way things sound. They said like net curtains or shutters. Well, what mm. if one is more practical for you but it's not in the same class or whatnot? Yeah. That just sounds exhausting to have to worry about every item you bring into your house and all of your furnishings that much. Well, if that's the case, if class in the UK is about what's in your house, then that does seem like class is a much bigger part of the British identity mm, than I yeah. previously thought. Yeah, same. If I go to the shop and I'm looking for curtains or something to cover the windows, I've never ever considered, is this appropriate for my class? Mm -hmm. Is this appropriate for where yeah. I am on the social ladder? I would think, does this match my aesthetic? Mm -hmm. Do I like it? Will it get the job done? I would never go to someone's house and see their curtains or their rugs and judge or kind of place them on the social ladder. Like, where yeah. is this person? I would never think of it like that. Like, maybe I would be like, oh, I like their curtains or, yeah. oh, their curtains are kind of interesting. But it wouldn't be the sort of thing that I would be like, oh, 
this person is working class because of their <laughs> window covers. <laughs> yeah, I think the only situation where I would do that would be if their furnishings were over the top expensive. If they have suits of armor in the corner and wooden furniture laced in gold. Mm, you know, they just... have a bust of them or something yeah, like they that. Have, they have family portraits, floor to ceiling. And, and a I'm chocolate like, fountain. Okay, you must be doing well. But <laughs> other than that, I'm not really <laughs> looking for those clues. Wow, this makes me want to, like, now I'm thinking back through all the houses we went into <laughs> in the UK, and I'm trying to place everyone that we met. No, that's terrible. Well, it's kind of like a game now. Yeah, I mean, I guess from our <laughs> point of view, it's not really... I don't care what class you're in. Yeah, because coming from America, it's like, yeah. you can be whatever you want to be. Egalitarianism, baby. This is blowing my mind. I didn't know it was this complicated. This no. is so complicated. Oh my goodness, yeah. It must be wow. exhausting to be a Brit. Is it exhausting? Are you just not free to like certain things then? Depending yeah. on what class you're in. Like, what if you just really want shutters, but it's not appropriate for your class. Real quick, before we get to the next point, we're gonna take a moment here to interrupt your program and uh, so solicit you. That sounds bad. <laughs> we're not soliciting you, we're informing you. If you guys want to see behind the scenes footage as well as bloopers, outtakes, deleted scenes from today's episode, among others, make sure that you go on over and join our Patreon. Link in the description below. And now, back to your broadcast. An absolute rule of thumb is you cannot have anything in a house pretending to be something else. So for example, if you want lino in your kitchen, that's fine, but you don't have lino with a tile pattern on it. So what is it, lino or is it pretend tiles? You mustn't have anything that's pretending to be something else. Hmm. Okay, Americans definitely offend in this regard. The flooring market in America is exploding with options that look like they're supposed to be something else. So mm -hmm. like false hardwood or false tile or false ceramic. And it's really just like linoleum or vinyl mm -hmm. or something like that. Every American house has, does this offense. Has something <laughs> that's pretending to be something else. But you can get clever with floors. Take an ordinary floor, class it up. Bah, croquet set. Have to cover up the Harrod sign, that's too vulgar. Get a gym bag, posh school scarf, some riding stuff, green wellies. Now it's a marvelous toff corner. So he said Harrods is vulgar. Is that because it's a working class thing or an upper class thing? Yeah, it must be too on the nose in some way. If your walls are painted white with a hint of sizal, and right over in the far corner is one chair, posh. Or possibly wanker, I don't know. Or Wes Anderson. Of course, the exception to this is the irony rule, which is a good rule to cite if you find you've dropped a class clangor. Claim your garden gnomes or flying ducks are ironic, but you have to tell people you're being ironic, otherwise it doesn't work. People just think you have no taste. What's anybody doing with a jukebox in their house? Oh, no, that's kind of... 70s ironic. No, that just makes you look like Alvin Stardust. Ironic. Home decor. That's another thing that I've never heard of before. For example, I've been in someone's house in the States who had multiple jukes boxes and someone might think of them as being a little bit eccentric, but you know, it, you know when bats an eye. Yeah, you wouldn't have to defend the fact that it's in your home or point out that you're making an ironic statement of any kind, right? That yeah. wouldn't be a thing. That's just, that's another thing that's blowing my mind because I've never heard of that concept before of having to defend something in your home as ironic. Like, oh, don't, don't worry about the talking fish on the wall, it's ironic. Don't worry about Horton here. Horton's not ironic. He's, he's bevied. He's bevied. He's constantly bevied, but he's only ironically. All the time. <laughs> The irony rule doesn't work with names, of course. Your position on the class scale is scarily visible because it gives away your birth class for all to see. Oh, I think we all know a post-Christian name when we get it. It's Piers and Peregrine. Upper-class names Christian that will always be upper-class will be Sebastian. Arabella, Susanna, or they have nicknames. Mindy, Bunty, Nemo. It just it was fun, you know, because the thing was, is that uh, when I was very, very, very little, we had a nanny, and she didn't know <laughs> she how to pronounce my name. So we just, you know, I'm getting wah. <laughs> Middle class names end in E. Katie, Phoebe, Emily. Josh and Tom and uh, Jack. Working class names will often sort of land with a thud. Jade. Kylie. Wayne. Well... We must have working class names. Grace. And Eric. 
If I was Gracie, though, I could be middle class. There we go. Ericky. Ricky. Ricky. There we go. There we go. Ricky and Gracie. Middle class. <laughs> uh, we Look can redo today's intro. Okay, go. Yeah. Hey guys, I'm Ricky. And I'm Gracie. We're the middle class Ravens. Ravens. Uh, we're the middle class Ravens. <laughs> My mother was actually hysterical, probably the biggest snob I've ever known. And I remember when I was about 15, she said to me, you can marry outside your nationality, marry outside your religion, but for God's sake, don't marry outside your class. Wow. Okay, so that answers our question from the beginning, is class an identity? And Absolutely, if, yes, if, and if that's the case. If that's the case, she's saying it's even a greater identity than race and religion. Yeah. Is maybe, that true? Okay, I have a theory. Perhaps okay. it is a greater identity than race or religion if you land in certain classes. So uh, maybe if you're an upper class, then that defines you more than your race or religion because marrying outside of your class would be like a big ooh. deal. Whereas if you're in maybe working class, then it's not necessarily something that defines you quite as much as race or religion. I think that's a really good observation. Yeah, that's probably what it is. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it defines you if you're in a class where marrying outside of it would be scandalous. Yeah, a really big deal. So is that the reason why when Harry married Meghan, there was such a big to-do about it? Because he's in, you know, in the, the t top, top class mm -hmm. and he's quite obviously marrying outside of his class. In the States, from the American perspective, that sort of thing we are huge fans of. Like when Meghan married Harry, we were all like, yeah! Well, not us. Not us, not... because we don't keep up with the royals, yeah. but a lot of Americans were felt that way. Yeah, there's the royals have a lot of fans in the States, and they loved the idea that a com commoner, mm -hmm. if you, that's what you would call her, could marry into royalty. Like, that's considered, you know, it's the Disney, Disney dream, basically. We're like, take that, Lord. We'll never be royals, my ass. Oh, oh <laughs> we that could be Lord. royals. <laughs> I was like, Lord? <laughs> no. Is it she pronounced Lord or Lord? The Lord, Lord, the Lord, artist. The artist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dang you, ruined a perfectly I'm good sorry. moment. Sorry, that was a good light. Good light. <laughs> it's a good it's one. Genuinely. Well done. First. We are just killing it. We're just tearing this here. up. <laughs> but should you wish to be the class police? What are the sort of interrogation techniques you need to learn? There's a lot of feeling around. What sort of house do you live in? Uh, um, uh, and what do you do? And how much money you earn? That guy seems really upper class. I'm, I'm just guessing based on the I'm way he talks. I'm guessing he is too. The way he talks. Because uh, he does this uh, at the end of every word. It's kind of annoying. Yeah. It's, it seems like he's putting on airs. Where does she live? What does her father do? And if you live there, do you know the exits? Yeah, he Whereabouts in Battersea? Mm -hmm. um, oh, just off near the bridge. Does it take you very long to get to work from there? Eh? Where, do you, where do you work? Is it a Georgian house? Is it a Georgian house? Is it, is it a Georgian house or is it a terrace? It's quite a long way from the city, for instance, isn't it? From Enfield. Yeah. Which end of the terrace? Could is it that finish? end? So this is, these are the sort of questions you ask when you meet someone to figure out what class what they're in. What class they're in. That's really interesting. Ooh, I'd feel so intimidated if someone started grilling me with these questions. Because you know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. terrifying. I'd just be like, I'm homeless and I have a rucksack. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever you sit on the class ladder, there's always someone to sneer down at. Snobbery, it seems, is something we learn from our mothers. And worst class clangor of all is common. Common was a term of abuse. She's common. You know, but we were common. Don't know what my mum was saying. You know, we, we had nothing. When I was growing up, common. the worst thing that you could be told was that something that you had done was considered common. I found the common people really rather exciting because I went to a girls' grammar school and there weren't very many common people there. I, I tried to attach myself to the most common ones and they were always called gay. Because okay, she's wow. definitely not working, working class if yeah. she went to a girl's grammar school. And if she considers, if she's referring to a kind of people as common. As common. That sounds very feudalistic yeah. to my ears. Really old fashioned. The peasants, the, the commoners. The commoners. Yeah, that seems like a really horrible thing to say. It's, no offense, men. Yeah. It's a really horrible thing to say. <laughs> it really is because it's making the divide that much worse. So they must be talking about upper class here because that's the op. if you're, the middle class want to associate with the working class. Mm -hmm. But if you're using the word common, you're obviously distinguishing yourself from the working yeah. class. So that must be an upper class thing to say is common. 
Or is it a middle class thing? I, I, I feel that would like be it, kind yeah, of contradictory. To what we learned. Yeah. 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 Do verify that for us. Is co- using the word common in this derogatory way, a specifically upper class thing. And is it still used? Because this seems really outdated. Some of these people who are saying that it was used when they were children are middle-aged as well. So Yeah, these are some older folks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's possible that maybe that's not a common uh, mm-hmm. expression anymore. <laughs> <laughs> The word common means to me frequently to be encountered. Common, if you use the word, shows that you're rather common because only common people use the word common. Okay, well, that's really interesting because that would mean if he's being truthful, that means it's not posh. Maybe it's working class people trying to distance themselves from working class people. From other working class people. So maybe the classes break down even further. Further. Yeah, maybe there's more than three. Like, there's broadly three, but then there's, like, smaller ones in between. The English class system is an onion. It's It's getting more and more complicated. It's getting more and more complicated (laughs) and burning your eyes and making you cry the more you find Mm. out about it. (laughs) Well, this is very interesting. Coming, you know, we lived in South Korea for two years. And in South Korea, there is a very strong hierarchical system where things like money and status and job and all those sorts of things really play a part on where you fall in the hierarchy. And the Korean language even has two distinct forms, an informal version of the language and a formal version. And depending on where someone is in the hierarchy, you use one version or the other when addressing them. In my head, I always thought of that as a very Asian thing because over there it's based in Buddhism and Confucianism and, you know, those very philosophies. Mm -hmm. Um, Where a lot of respect is shown to people who are in a position that would be considered above you. Though when it comes to differences between the hierarchy in the UK and the hierarchy in Korea, for example, in Korea, or at least from what I recall by conversations with Koreans, it's fine to ask how much money a person makes because Mm -hmm. over there they want to establish where you are in the hierarchy as soon as they meet you so that they know which kind of language to use with you, the formal or informal. So introduction questions, you know, what kind of car do you have? What school do you work at? How old are you? How old are you? You gotta find out how old someone is right away. Yeah, so these are like introduction questions. They ask these things and it's like, okay, now I know where in the hierarchy you are. Now I know what kind of language to use with you and our relationship is set going forward. This is wild. This is honestly just blowing my mind. Because I did not know that there was a hierarchy like this in the UK. That was this intense. Like yeah. in the States, we don't really talk about class. No, I don't think that's really a discussion you it's would have. It's not an have. identity thing. Yeah. Maybe a distinction between the UK and the States and the way we each talk about class is in the States, class is a position that you are in temporarily. Mm-hmm. But it's not a state of mind. Whereas it seems like in the UK, class is very much a state of mind. And it affects everything that you do and even the way that you decorate mm-hmm. your house or what you name your children. That's impressive. Wild stuff. Come the grumpy revolution when no one gives a stuff anymore where you went to school or whether you have fish knives or are vulgar enough to have bought your own furniture. He said people care about whether you're vulgar enough to buy your own furniture. So there must be a thing about buying your furniture, whether or not you bought it or inherited it. Or inherited it? it? Maybe. Oh, I would not want to inherit furniture from my grandparents. (laughs) (laughs) Like, think of all the terrible (laughs) styles that were in back then. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, I don't want my grandma's couch. Come the grumpy revolution when no one gives a stuff anymore where you went to school or whether you have fish knives or are vulgar enough to have bought your own furniture and the meritocracy has kicked in, then class will be consigned to history only to be found in the Blue Peter time capsule. For now, we seem to be stuck with it, but the point of it rather escapes us. You know, you don't see anywhere in the world the same obsession with class. I don't think there's any other country in the world where you can tell somebody's class the moment they open their mouth when you could tell the moment they say their first sentence where their father went to school. Only in Britain would you do that. And only in Britain does anybody think it's remotely important. Just move on! Wow! All right, well. Can we take these out? Let's take these out and have uh, closing thoughts. Closing thoughts time. Wow! (laughs) Wow! What? We didn't even plan that, but that no. happened perfectly. <laughs> That's my closing thought is just, wow. There is a lot to unpack there and a lot to think about there. There's so much interesting psychology that I want to just mull mm-hmm. over. 
You could write several books about this. We need some books about this. Yes. If you know of any good books about classism in the UK and about that history, do drop those recommendations down in the comments because we love reading and would love to get our hands on some of those. So the guy who finished up the documentary with his comments and whatnot, he basically said that as soon as you speak, other Brits will know where you are in the whole class system. Maybe that's why people still do elocution lessons mm -hmm. in the UK and why accent is so important. Yeah, I had yeah. never really thought about it in that way because you can be, you can literally have any accent in the States and that has nothing to do with mm -hmm. where you are. On the ladder. On the ladder, yeah. I mean, just look at our president. <laughs> I think I just need to sit back and let this just marinate for a while because there are so many things to think about here. We went into this thinking that it was going to be kind of easy to explain and easy to understand, but as we peeled back the layers, like I said, onion, <laughs> there's just more and more layers. There's so much to it that there's no way you can process it in just one sitting. I don't yeah. think there's a lot there. We need a book. Yes. And a couple more documentaries. This is retroactively, even now, changing the way I view our trip to the UK last year. Mm -hmm. Because while we were there, we were completely oblivious to there yeah. being any classes. So now I'm thinking, oh, it was, you know, the interactions we had with certain people and certain mm -hmm. questions they ask. Is that something that Brits project onto? Because we projected our, our lack of thinking about classes yeah. onto... British culture, so we just kind of didn't really think of it as an issue, but do they do the same thing then to Americans? Like when they meet Americans, will they mm. kind of subconsciously know which class an American falls into? Or do they understand that Americans don't really use the same classes and therefore it doesn't really matter? Mm -hmm. I don't know. This is interesting. Food for thought. Yeah. I have never thought about classism more than I have in the last 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not really a discussion in the States. We talk about wealth inequality, we talk about the 1% and mm -hmm. middle class, you know, that's we want to be middle mm -hmm. class. Mm -hmm. But we, this sort of conversation where we're talking about old money, new money, upper class does and talks a certain way, and mm -hmm. working class does and talks a certain way, this is completely new to us. Very new. Except for, like I said, that little bit that we did get in Korea. But this is in English, so I understand yeah. a lot more of it. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, we hope you guys enjoyed this video. This is the first time we've done a reaction video like this. If you enjoyed it, let us know, and maybe we'll do more. More videos of this style. And if you have any insight or resources to help us better understand the whole class system and cla different classes in the UK, <laughs> please drop them in the comments below. We always love yeah. learning from you guys, and this is an issue that we are very curious about now. Yeah, this is, again, I hope we didn't say anything offensive. These were all just our genuine reactions to learning about this. So my mind is just overwhelmed at the moment. I'll probably have a lot more thoughts as this marinates. We're gonna end the video here. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit the like button for the YouTube algorithm. And if you wanna support this channel and help us make better quality content more often, do go down to the description and join our Patreon. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel as well. We have a new goal of hitting 15,000 subscribers by the time June rolls around. So if you wanna help us meet that goal, subscribe and hit the bell notification. Again, I'm Eric. And I'm Grace. We're the Wandering Ravens. And we will see you guys in the next video. Bisous!